Shalom. On this week's program, we're going to meet people who believe in themselves and in their vision, and despite the difficulties placed before them, they continue to achieve and create. Let's get the show on the road. Shalom and welcome to Israeli Salad. Last program we talked about Tu Bishvat. This year Tu Bishvat fell on a Shabbat and so the festival was celebrated on Friday and on Sunday as well. On that Sunday I drove down south to celebrate this festival. Down south to the Gaza Strip. When you see the children from the Jewish town of Kfar Darom planting new trees in their town, the last thing that seems possible is that these residents will be forcefully transferred from their homes. I joined more than a thousand people from all over the country who came to celebrate the festival of Tubishvat in Gush Katif. Gush Katif is the main region of Jewish communities in the Gaza Strip. In Gush Katif there are new towns populated by young couples beside veteran towns where there are families with children and grandchildren all living in Gush Katif. We are here to show that we love uh, Eretz Israel and we love Gush Katif and we're never gonna leave it. It's ours forever. We came just to plant some trees but I'm having a really great time. It's so much fun here. <laughs> just beauty. Uh, a lot of cherry tomatoes, a lot of plants all over. If there's any place to describe heaven, it's over here. Uh, how many people do you know that pay uh, nothing on rent and they live so close to the beach, you could see the beach from their house? Anytime in the summer you want to go for a good swim after a hard day of work? It's here, you've got a great environment. As you can see, everything here is green. What else can a person ask for? The local residents of Gush Katif took us on a tour through the different communities in the area. We visited a few greenhouses and even tasted a few cherry tomatoes. In Nevedek Kalim, the capital of Gush Katif, the central Tuvishvat event was taking place. In addition to experiencing Gush Katif from close, the visitors had the opportunity to take home products from this beautiful area. I'm selling strawberries, strawberries that are grown in a special process without the use of pesticides. We're here with some of our flower pots that we usually export. We also want to give the people of Israel the opportunity to plant a tree in the land of Israel and to remember Gush Katif in their home. Prime Minister Ariel Sharon recently announced that he's planning the eviction of most of the Jewish Gush Katif towns. Joined by members of the National Religious Party, the residents and visitors felt that participating in the Tu B'Shvat celebrations was the perfect response to Sharon's statements. Nobody will enable him to imply his awful plans to uh, dismantle Gush Katif, to dismantle, to dismantle our sense of life. It feels great to see all these people who came to strengthen us. Thank God the people of Israel stand behind us. We shall deepen the roots of the uh, settlers here in, on their land. Uh, there will be more buildings and more children and all the ideas uh, to evacuate the uh, people from here and to transfer them. Uh, we shall not be partners in this uh, plan. We shall not allow to carry it out. Do you think it will be possible that, the, that anything here will be given away at all? It doesn't look possible because there's so many people and so many settlements that it seems like it'd be impossible to pull them all out. I don't know what's possible, but I am absolutely devastated at the thought of evacuating anything here. All these talks are, as it says, like the waves of the sea that break onto the shore. With God's help, none of it will happen. This place uh, will uh, remain and will be developed and there will be more people and more children and more life here. For, for eternity. The peak of the experience was to be involved in a natural development and expansion of Gush Katif through the planting of trees in the soil of the land of Israel. More than 3,000 trees were planted this year on Tu B'Shvat in Gush Katif.
Some of you might remember that this wasn't the first time we visited Gush Katif on Israeli Salad 7. We brought you the Gush Katif Music Festival. So I'm taking this opportunity to tell you all that you can view the past editions of Israeli Salad on our website. Just click the Israeli Salad button and you can scroll through all our programs. Ma'on Nechim is a non-profit residential home situated on the outskirts of the coastal city of Netanya. It caters to severely disabled young adults. A unique art group in this institute proves that with self-determination, anyone can create art. In order to truly appreciate these paintings, you have to know the story that lies behind these works of art. As with all other paintings, the paintbrush is the tool used to create the art, but these paintings use a completely different technique. Ten years ago, Sandra Katalov, an artist originally from England, started working at Ma'on Nechim, the home for the disabled in Netanya. She started with one art student and gradually expanded her teaching to a larger group of artists with different disabilities. I think the biggest challenge in this class is trying to work out how, with their disability, each student can paint. The art group can be divided into three groupings, hand painters, mouth painters, and foot painters. But that division doesn't say anything about the style and approach of each and every artist. If they're using their foot, what type of painting suits their foot? Um, what type of painting they like? Each one has a different idea of painting. We have Ronit, a, ma a mouth painter, fine, fine art. You know, beautiful, delicate flowers, small brushes, beautiful, beautiful work. I'm working with Chaya, who can only paint with her foot. Um, at the moment, we're putting a background onto a painting. You then go to Marielle, who is amazing. He works with a big brush, a small brush. He draws. He's magnificent, absolutely magnificent. Then you have Jemana over here, who is the most wonderful painter, limited hand movement, but uses... A talent that is, you have to see her paintings to believe them. Considering the different types of disabilities Sandra and her team have to deal with, they must be creative and innovative on behalf of the artists. For instance, Marielle. We had to work out how he could actually get to the top of a canvas when the canvas is big. So he turns the canvas upside down. I've tried painting upside down, it's impossible, but he can do it. She looks in the mirror because she can't actually look at her painting, so we get a reflection in the mirror for her, and then she can see what she's doing. The world of art's a wonderful form of expression for these people um, because most of them can't even speak clearly, and they are able to express their feelings, their emotions, and a great deal of skill, most of them, uh, through their limited use of, uh, of motor skills. I'm painting. <laughs> I enjoy painting every Wednesday. I love to come Wednesday to be all my friends here, all the volunteers, teacher, good teacher. And it's great to do something you maybe you think I, I'm can, I can do it. And it's uh, wonderful to see when it's finished. This group, every week I come here, they help us and make us happy. They let us feel good. They put a lot of effort into making us happy and to let us create whatever we're able to. I try my best. Not always I can success, but I try my best. Ronnie, this is so beautiful. It's um, a typical Ronnie um, painting. Lovely colors and very, very beautiful. I think, I think it, it affects their life in many, many ways. They have a lot of fun. Every week they wait for the next Wednesday when they come here. We laugh a lot. And I think that's the success of this class is that we laugh a lot. They're wonderful, especially people, all of them. People think the paintings are absolutely amazing. I agree with them.
What does the Western Wall mean to you? The Kotel is so special. Right now we have the Kotel, we can dive into it. it we can dive in facing it. And on the way to me, that's kind of diving in it. Clips of Naftali Abramson's music are played throughout our program. I've received emails from people who asked for details about Naftali's album. So here's Naftali Abramson's email, migdal at netvision.net.il. That's migdal at netvision.net.il. <laughs> You are watching Israel National News TV. Last program, Avraham Chassidim from the Carmel Orchard spoke of the agricultural value of the precept of Orla. The commandment forbids eating fruit of a newly planted tree for the first three years. Rabbi David Samson joins us now from Jerusalem. Shalom Rabbi Samson. Shalom Yoni. So what's the meaning of this biblical commandment? Well, uh, first of all, technically, uh, it's very rare to have fruit during the first three years. There are a few exceptions. One of them, for instance, is the papaya tree, which uh, has fruit only for the first three years, and that if we would have orla, then nobody would ever be allowed to eat the papaya fruit. As a result, the rabbis say that <coughs> it's impossible that God would have created a fruit that is forbidden to eat, and therefore the rabbis say that the laws of orla do not apply to the papaya fruit and you are allowed to eat them during the first three years. And the laws of Arla only apply to the fruits which are, belong to regular normal trees that during the first three or four years of the tree usually they don't bear fruit or they don't bear fruit which is actually worth eating. The basic idea behind many mitzvot is that we're supposed to recognize the fact that God is the master of both land and uh, heaven and the master of all trees, and that we recognize uh, God's absolute uh, reign over uh, the fruit. And during the first three years, we realize that they are designated totally uh, off limits to man and only for God. In the fourth year, this is where we have what is called neta revai. We take the fruit and then bring it to Jerusalem, and every tree begins its career by having its fruit taken to Jerusalem by those who eat it, eating the fruit in Jerusalem, and then after the inauguration ceremony of the tree, in the fifth year, we eat the fruit regularly. Nowadays, because uh, we uh, can't eat the fruit in a status of purity, we usually redeem the fruit. Thank you very much, Rabbi Samson. The Weekly Insight is brought to you in cooperation with Mahon Meir, the largest Zionist institute in Israel, bringing people closer to Judaism. That's all for this week. Join us again next week for another edition of Israeli Salad. Until then, Shabbat Shalom and Shavua Tov.